Cool, chapter two, atoms, molecules, ions. First thing that I just talk about is atomic structure. So four big guys important in kind of giving us info about our atomic structure. And the first was Dalton. And he just kind of came up with his own version of the atomic theory. So the atomic theory was actually kind of something proposed by the ancient Greeks that, you know, all matter was made up of this indivisible substance they called the atom and so on and so forth. Well, Dalton, much later on here, uh, revived this theory. So when he said that all elements are made, the smallest chunk of each element is an atom. And the atoms of one element are all different than the atoms of another element. And the atoms of one element all each have exactly the same mass and so on and so forth. That was Dalton. He pioneered the atomic theory. So kind of similar to the present form that we currently accept. Now, Mr. Thompson here, JJ Thompson, he discovered the electron. So using a cathode ray tube, Mr. Millikan here actually figured out the mass of an electron in his classic oil drop experiment. And then finally, Mr. Rutherford, he shot alpha, alpha particles through a very thin gold sheet. So anybody know exactly what happened with those alpha particles that were aimed at the gold sheet? Bounced in different directions. Actually, most of them just went right through. Most of them went right through. Some of them scattered just a little bit, but some of them actually were rejected so and forced backwards. And that was the really big thing. And what Rutherford then predict, you know, predicted out of that is that you know, the gold here, the atoms that make it up, are mostly made up of empty space. And that's why most of the alpha particles pass right through. But there are concentrated areas where are, there are just a bunch of protons. We now know protons and often neutrons, especially in the case of gold. Uh, that is the nucleus. And so Rutherford came up with the idea of the nucleus at the center of an atom. So where most of the mass is and the rest of it is mostly empty space, which was not enough to deflect the alpha particles much off of their, their trajectory. Um, cool. After this, you should know some things about isotope symbols. So let's say we look at, uh, let's not go down. Let's look at fluorine here and specifically we'll look at fluorine 19. Yeah, we'll go with fluorine 19. So this is an isotope of fluorine. So this number here, 19, we call it the. No, he's the mass number. What would be the atomic number? Good. So and you don't have to write it because the atomic number determines the element. If it's fluorine, its atomic number is 9. If the atomic number is 9, it's fluorine. So in this case, that's why I didn't have to give it to you. And you could figure it out right off the periodic table. But that is your atomic number. And what does the atomic number always tell you about an element? Uh, how, many, how many protons and electrons? Good. Gives you how many protons. And as long as the species is neutral, it would also give you the number of electrons. Now, protons have what charge? Protons have a charge of positive one. Good. Protons are positive one. Electrons? Negative. Negative one. And so as long as there's no charge written right here, then you should have an equal number of both. What's the other subatomic particle we haven't talked about yet? Neutrons, and what are their charge? Zero. Zero, hence the really bad joke. Neutron walks into a bar, orders a drink, says, how much will it be? And the bartender says, for you, no charge. Yeah, OK, terrible. All right, in this case, your mass number, your electrons weigh almost nothing. So most of your mass is just protons and neutrons. And they weigh about 1 AMU each. So in this case, my mass number is really the sum of protons and neutrons. The atomic number is really just the protons. So if I want to find out the neutrons, what do I do? Take the difference between the two. So in this case, how many neutrons we got in fluorine 19? Good, 10 neutrons. In this case, if I change the number of neutrons, it would change the mass number. And I'd get a different what? I would get a different mass number. So let's say we add a neutron in there. If I had a neutron in there, I would get fluorine with what mass number? Good, fluorine 20. And when you have a different mass number of the same element, we call them two different isotopes. So if you change the number of neutrons, which changes the mass number, you get a different isotope. Now, what if, on the other hand, instead of changing the number of neutrons, what if I just removed an, um, actually, what if I added an electron? If I add an extra electron to this, what would the charge be now? Oh, I'm adding a negative charge. The electron's negative. Oh, sorry, negative. So negative one, we write that right here. And what would that ultimately change? How do I get a charge? It's the number of electrons. I add an extra one, so now we'd have 10 electrons instead. So when you change the number of electrons, you're changing the charge. Finally, what if I change the number of protons? 
either by adding or taking away a proton here, what would that actually change? Wouldn't you? Uh, it might, you know, if we don't change the electrons, it might affect the charge. But more importantly, in principle, it actually changes the element. Notice the atomic number determines the element. So if you change that atomic number, you now have a different element. So the protons change the element. Change that, different element. Cool. Cool. So carbon 12 versus carbon 12.011. Would we ever write this? Why not? Good. The mass number is always rounded to the nearest whole number. So this is a specific isotope of carbon that has six protons, six neutrons, and hence has a mass number closest to 12. But there's also carbon 13. There's also carbon 14. There are different isotopes. Now, it turns out 99% of all the naturally occurring carbon is carbon 12. Roughly 1% is carbon 13, and a very, very, very tiny fraction of 1% is carbon 14. This 12.011, which we would never write this way, but that's what you see here on the periodic table, 12.011. What is that? It's actually the average weight of a carbon atom. So if you have a sample of naturally occurring carbon, 99% of the atoms weigh 12, 1% weigh 13, and 0 .00 something or other percent weigh 14. If you take a weighted average of those three naturally occurring isotopes, taking into account their relative natural abundances. That's where the 12.011 comes from. So this number is not the weight of any specific isotope, but the average of them. Based on the average being 12.011, you could say, oh yeah, you definitely have way more of this than you have of any other isotope, because that average is coming out really close to 12. Cool. So when we talk about the atomic weight or atomic mass that we see here on the periodic table, it is no individual isotope's mass. It is always a weighted average. But because most of our elements have one major isotope, it always comes out close to one of the isotope's masses. And I say always, almost always. So if you notice, what do you suppose is the major isotope for nitrogen? 14. 14. Oxygen? 16. 16. Fluorine? 19. 19. Bromine? Uh, 80. 80. Wrong. Turns out, with bromine, this doesn't work. So the average atomic mass is right around 80. But it turns out bromine 80 doesn't exist. So for bromine, there are two major isotopes, bromine 79 and bromine 81. And guess roughly how much of each you have naturally occurring. It's roughly 50-50. So it turns out it's 50.5%, 49.5%. And that's why the average comes out really close to what a 50-50 average would work out and comes out close to 80. However, with chlorine, that is not the case. Notice chlorine doesn't come out close to a whole number. I'm going to round this to 35 and a half for the next question on your hand out there. But it says that chlorine has two major isotopes, chlorine 35 and chlorine 37. And we're going to assume that chlorine 35, as on your hand out there, weighs 35 AMUs. Truth be told, if you got this question on the test, they would probably give you a couple extra sig figs at least on this. And chlorine 37 weighs 37 AMUs. And again, on a test, you'd get a couple extra sig figs there. The question becomes, based on the natural abundances given, what is the actual atomic weight of chlorine? And you're told 75% of naturally occurring chlorine weighs 35, 25% weighs 37. In this case, though, you could have inferred this by looking at the periodic table. So this average here, is it closer to 35 or 37? 35, and that's how we would have already known that there's more chlorine 35 than 37. But in this case, given these natural abundances, how do I get a weighted average? How do I come up with that 35 and a half, that 35.4527 if we use more exact numbers? Huh? Sort of. How do we account for this different? If that was 50 50, it would per work perfectly, right? We just add these two together and divide by two, but we can't do that here. So here, let's just assume for a minute we had 100 atoms of chlorine and their natural relative abundances. How many of those 100 atoms would weigh 35? 75. 75. So I'd say 75 times 35. And then how many would weigh 37? Uh, 25. 25. So plus 25 times 37. And then to get the average mass of all 100 atoms, what would I do? So, 
Uh, divide by what? So again, how many atoms do I have? Divide by 100, because I got 100 atoms in this fictitious example. I divide by 100. Well, we're going to do something similar here. Notice dividing by 100 is really something mathematically. I can split this up instead of one giant fraction, split it up into two separate fractions, right? What's 75 divided by 100? Point seven five. So I could write this as 0. 0.75 times 35. What's 25 divided by 100? 0.25 times 37. And this is how we'd normally have you calculate an atomic mass. Take the decimal form of the percent, multiply by that corresponding mass, add it to the decimal form of the other percent times its corresponding mass, and just simply go from there. Now we assume that we had 100 atoms of this, but we don't actually have to assume that 100 atoms. This is kind of the standard way. What do we get if we do this? And we'll actually get 35 and a half because I gave you all rounded numbers. But if I gave you the exact percentages and the exact masses of the individual isotopes, we would come out with that 35.4527. Sweet. So let's talk about the periodic table for just a minute. We call it periodic because uh, basically it's periodic in the same sense of like the rising of the sun every day. You know, every 24 hours, sun rises. Boom. Happens again. Boom. Happens again. Boom. Same thing here. We group these into columns of elements with similar chemical properties. The alkali metals here all react very violently with water. So we go across the periodic table, and then boom, we hit another one. And then we go across again, a few elements down the way, and boom, we hit another one, and so on and so forth. So one thing you should realize, one, these are grouped in similar, chemi you know, similar chemical reactivities. If I ask for two elements with similar chemical reactivities uh, on a multiple choice question, pick two from the same column, the same group. Um, you should also know how we separate this. We got a lovely staircase that some periodic tables kind of have going through here. What does that se staircase separate? It separates the metals from the non-metals. Metals from the non-metals. Which side has the metals? The metals are going to be on the left hand side. Good, left hand side. All the metals you kind of think of like silver, gold, iron, so on and so forth. So the metals are all over here. Non-metals are over here. And five or six that are right along the staircase are? Uh, metalloids. Metalloids, sometimes called semi-metals, and it's because they have properties intermittent between metals and non-metals. Notice metals are really good conductors, non-metals are really good insulators, but something like silicon, a semi-metal, is somewhere in between, is it a semi-conductor? So again, those metalloids, somewhere in between. Um, you should also know some of the group's names. Group one here, you should definitely know their name. They are the alkali metals. Group two, so except for hydrogen, not a metal. So, and then group two, they are the alkaline Earth metals, sweet, sweet. Uh, group, the last one here, which includes your favorite, by the way, noble gases. These are the halogens. And then you should also know that right in here, in between scandium and zinc and on down, these are the transition metals. So, and in another chapter later on down the road, we will definitely dive a little further into those. But we'll worry about that at a much later time.